Recently, we started talking about the Torah, the Torah Shebechtav, the Torah Shebaal Peh, the written Torah, and the oral Torah. Tonight's topic will be, why doesn't this Torah mention one of the most important ideals or goals that we're looking forward to, and that is Olam Abba. Why isn't there any mention of Olam Abba, the world to come, in this Torah? After all, isn't this what we're working so hard for? We eventually want to have a share to the world to come. So one of the most important parts of our tradition, of our beliefs, for some reason is not clearly mentioned in the Torah. Why not? Wouldn't it be good if the Torah would tell us and promise us that this is what you will have, that it should be clear why we're performing the mitzvot, what's the ultimate purpose, the tachlit? And the second question, we're combining two questions into one, is a related question. Why does the Torah not talk about the reward for the mitzvot themselves? The reward for the performance of the mitzvot is not really mentioned in the Torah. And at another time we will talk about the various kinds of rewards. Why doesn't the Torah mention the kind of reward? What reward you get for this mitzvah, what reward you get for that mitzvah, and so forth. But what we really want to know is, is why there is no sachar, there's no reward for mitzvot performed in Olam Hazeh during our lifetime. Because we do know that there eventually will be a reward. We will be compensated for all the hard work at some point. What we want to know is what happens in this world during our lifetime of 70, 80 years, why there's no mention of any compensation, or is there? So I have to give you a little bit of an introduction that covers an important concept in the Kabbalah. First of all, we need to understand what Olam Abba is. For those of you who were here before, we spoke about the concept of Olam Abba, meaning a world after this world. It is not necessarily the period of time that comes after Mashiach arrives, even though that is also very special. But the real Olam Abba begins at least after one departs from this world, that's called Olam HaNeshamot, the world of the souls. And it really continues on to the eternal life, which is after the 6,000 years are up. This world is 6,000 years. It will not last more than 6,000 years, as we know, the physical world. Then begins Olam Haba, a new world, completely different world, a spiritual world. So when we're talking about Olam Haba, we're talking about a combination of Olam HaNeshamot, when the souls are in Gan Eden, in paradise, after they've left this world, plus their continuation in receiving the benefit of all their hard work in the world that will follow this world. The Kabbalah explains that the whole idea behind the creation, why HaKadosh Baruch Hu created this world, is an act of goodness. It's all chesed. He is good. The essence of the Almighty is good, and the nature of good is to do good unto others. And in order to benefit others, there need to be recipients of that good. And that is why all that He created are meant to be the recipients of all that good that He has to give. However, in this world, in the Olam HaAsiyah, as we call it in the physical world, even though it's all good, there is a mixture of evil, a mixture of bad. It's not a, a complete world, it's not a perfect world. Man was given that job to perfect it, but because of the imperfection there appears to us to be sometimes evil and things are not just going the way we would like it to go because there is an irbuvia. There is a mixture of the two forces that were created. And why were they created? In order to allow free will. So. Even though this world is all about goodness, in this particular world that we live in, it is sometimes very difficult to find that goodness because we see a lot of bad, a lot of evil. However, in the world to come, where there is no Yetzirah, where there's no evil inclination at all, where there, we don't have to do battles with, with our instincts and with each other, it will be a perfect world. That's Olam Abba. Now, the system of acquiring that Olam Abba is called mitzvot. The kiyuma mitzvot, the performance of the mitzvot, is the system through which we work in order to achieve the ultimate goal 
Olam Abba. And that is something that is elaborated more in the Kabbalah as to why is the system really necessary? Because of something called Nahamad Eki Sufa. Nahamad Eki Sufa means bread of shame. We would be embarrassed to receive something for free. And therefore, in order not to be embarrassed, we have to earn it. Since we are a part of God, we have the nature to also be good. And if we were to receive something for free, there would be a certain imperfection in us. Because good, the nature of goodness, is to give, not to receive, not to take. Good wants to give. But in order for us to be able to benefit from all that there is, HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to make it through a system of Kiyum Mitzvot in order that we should earn it. Only by earning it do we feel that we can receive it. Otherwise we would feel embarrassed. In other words, that embarrassment is a sign of something incomplete about us. Something that we're getting without having earned it. Here we are supposed to be giving and doing for others and here we are receiving something, just receiving, not having worked for it, that, that is an imperfection. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But you understand the idea of giving and receiving? In order to be able to benefit from all the reward that Kadosh Baruch Hu wants to give us in Olam Abba, He's set up a system where we will give and then we will receive. All right? And that is the idea of Kiyuma Mitzvot. In order for this system to work properly, there has to be free will. If there is no free will, then, and everything is obvious, then everybody will always be doing the right thing. Giving, 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 right? That's normal, because that is the essence of the Neshama, to give and to want to do good. The Kiyum HaMitzvot, observance of the mitzvot, is our opportunity to attach ourselves to that which is good, to that which is positive. When one is involved in an Avera or commits a sin, he's attaching himself to the other side, which is that which is evil or contrary to the will of Hashem. So this is important for us to keep in mind at all time. In order for the system to work properly, there has to be free will. And part of free will means that things are not so obvious or clear. And that is why in this world, Hashem's presence is not so obvious and clear. There are many people who dispute that. Many people who have yet to be convinced. They're agnostics, whatever you want. You know, they're called by different names. They're yet to be convinced, so they don't want to believe. Because it's not so obvious, but it was intentionally done so. In the same way that Hashem's presence in this world is not so obvious, and he has made it so. Also the ultimate tachlit, the ultimate goal, olam haba, the world to come, was never made obvious either. You follow me? In the same way that he himself, for good reason, has made himself concealed, and we talked about that separately, why does he conceal himself? Right? In the same way, he also conceals, at least partially, the goal of all this work, that it's olam haba. And we will soon see why does he have to conceal it? But part of it has to do at least with the fact that he wants to enable us to have complete free will. What happened, however, in Har Sinai, in the year 2448 from creation, there was a tremendous gilui. All of a sudden there was a tremendous revelation where he himself made himself known. Anochi Hashem Elokecha, we actually heard his voice. But this only happened one time in our history. The next time that it will happen, that it will be so obvious and clear, will be when Mashiach comes. But in the meantime, that was the only time where a great number of people, the Jews especially, were able to hear his voice. And what was the purpose of that revelation, which is contrary to his idea of concealing himself? To imbue in us, to instill in us, the knowledge, the recognition, the awareness of who he is, that he's the one that took us out of Egypt, that he's responsible for everything. We had to have that knowledge at least once ingrained in us, that there should be no room for any doubt. That are there any other powers in this world? Just like other cultures and religions believe in all sorts of powers, 
at one point, at one moment, we had to have it completely ingrained in us that there's nothing, en od mil vado, there's nothing else but him. And this is, of course, necessary in order for, for us to develop the relationship that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to develop with him. And that's a relationship that when we perform the mitzvot, we do it only because he said so. Whenever you have any doubt about what you do, why you do something, if somebody ever asks you, oh, why do you do this? You know what the easiest answer is? Because he said so. Some people are uncomfortable giving that kind of an answer, and some people, of course, will never be satisfied with that answer, but that, that is how you will be safe. Because if you tr say it with true conviction, with confidence, I do so because he said so, that shows a tremendous level of emuna, of faith and trust that you have in him. And that is exactly what was meant to be accomplished in Har Sinai, when we basically were so confident that we said, Na'asevin Ishma, we will follow, we will heed, we will do exactly as he says. So that revelation was very, very powerful, and it was very important for us, to, that we should know that there's nothing else other than him. And why we do the mitzvot, not for any reward and for any compensation. Number one reason is because he said so. And we know that he's the boss, and we know that it's for our benefit, because he said so. If he told us not to eat non-kosher food, it must be because it's to our benefit, because he said so. He created the world, and he knows better than anybody else. So let's not second-guess him. This idea will help us later on understand some of the additional questions once we understand that when we do something, we don't have to understand exactly why we do it. When you go and take a flight from here to Israel and you board the jumbo plane, do you first ask the pilot, I have to figure out how the plane flies, otherwise I won't board? You trust the pilot. He knows what he's doing. And you go on, of course you pay, you pay your, your ticket, but then you board and you go. Do you ask your doctor what he's about to do? I mean, you get more or less get an idea. Major surgery, you want to have an idea about exactly what he's going to do. You're not prepared to understand everything that he's going to tell you because he went eight, ten years to college to do what he's doing. But we trust him. And so should be our trust to Kadosh Baruch Hu, even though we don't understand why we do certain things. Whoever said we have to know the reason for everything? Whoever said that we have to understand the reason behind the mitzvah? So therefore, even if we do end up receiving some sort of compensation for the performance of the mitzvot, the Torah itself that we accepted upon ourselves and committed our lives to live by the Torah was never intended for that compensation. And it was here we are, we're hearing the voice of Hashem, we're saying that we will follow. That has nothing to do whatsoever with the compensation. Even though there is compensation, there is reward for the mitzvot, but that is not why we received it. That is not why we went along with it. Oh, great! He's promising us all these goodies. No, that's not the reason. We heard his voice. We were convinced that he's the boss. He took us out of Egypt. He proved himself. He kept his promise. We are, of course, going to listen to him. It's in the best of our interest. On Hashem's part, he doesn't want to get too involved and too direct about the mitzvot, because what kind of a relationship does he want to have with us? Banim atem l'Hashem elokechem, you are my children. You're not my employees. You see, that's the big difference. You know, there was our relationship, hopefully, should be that we are, we feel like his children. We are his sons. Not that he's the boss, that he will dictate, he will tell us what to do, and we will follow because we are employed. That's not the goal here. That was not our goal, and that was never his goal either. Nevertheless, you do come across in the Torah some very, very powerful threats. You better do this. <laughs> if you don't do this, this is what will happen. What's that all about? Well, you have to think back to when you were children. When we were children, our parents also from time to time had to 
use a hand and sometimes two hands to spank us or to get us to pay attention or to stay away from certain things because we didn't understand anything else. When learning Torah, especially when you're first introduced to this, there's a certain level of avodah miyir'ah. There's a certain level of worship out of fear. That's okay, it's acceptable. Because that is the first thing we understand that we can identify with, but that's not the goal. What is the goal of avodah Hashem that it should be? You should love Hashem with all your heart. That the service of Hashem should be with love. That you're excited to do this. There's a big difference when somebody does something out of fear or in anticipation of being compensated, rewarded, than somebody who's doing it out of love, voluntary, because it makes sense, because it's so right. There's a big difference. And we spoke about this in the past, the various levels that exist in, pe in people's lives, in why they do something or why they do not do something. Why do they hold themselves back? Why are they afraid of something? That is why the rabbis tell us in Pirkei Avot that one should always get used to serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu Shelo al menat lekabel pras. Don't be like the servants who look forward or anticipate some reward for their ma'asim, for their deeds. Do whatever you want to do, do whatever you need to do, out of love, without any compensation. That is the ultimate goal, but one does not arrive at that, one does not attain that level immediately. So you therefore have to first introduce to him compensation, or the opposite. This is what will happen, God forbid, if you're not careful. Now we will understand why the Sakhar is not so clearly mentioned in the Torah. The, re the actual reward for the mitzvot is not mentioned anywhere in the Torah. The Torah wants us to do the mitzvot for the ultimate goal, to serve Hashem, to have a relationship with Him, to do good in this world. And in, therefore, if that is the ultimate goal, nothing else is mentioned. If you put on tefillin, if you put on a mezuzah, this is, will be your reward, except for a few instances, which will, I will explain later, why the Torah did give us an example or an idea of what the compensation will be. But those are very few exceptions. For the most part, the Torah does not get into what the reward will be for the mitzvot, in order that we should be able to do them for the ultimate tachlit. This Torah that we have, remember, is also for Olam Azeh. Everything that is written in the Torah is for us to know how to behave in this world. In the world of the souls upstairs, they have no need for it, at least for the Torah as we know it. They also learn Torah, whatever is relevant to them. But in this, in this world, the mitzvot have what to do with? They have to do with homes, agriculture, being charitable, being giving to other people, being considerate, law and order, right? Sacrifices. All of this has to do with this world. And where is the Olam Abba? A completely different world. A world that has nothing to do with the mitzvot of the Torah. A completely spiritual world, not a physical world. So you're beginning to see why there's no real need to mention Olam Abba in this Torah, which is geared for Olam Azeh, for this world. This Torah really has nothing to relate to us about Olam Abba. It's talking to us in a language that we need to understand. We will understand things that relate to this world, not to something that is abstract, something that we can relate to. Not even the greatest prophets have a clue what Olam Abba looks like. They are told that there is, they told that that is the world of the gemul, of the reward for the mitzvot, but what it looks like, nobody has any idea. It's part of our emunah, part of our tradition. So the Torah needs to speak to us in terms that we understand. So one explanation as to, therefore, why Olam Abba is not really mentioned, at least openly, clearly, in the Torah. Another idea of why this Olam Abba is not mentioned is because we talked about it in, in describing what Torah Shebal is, the oral tradition, the oral word, many things were handed down to us orally, not in written form, right? We have part of the Torah in written form and a great, part, a great deal of the Torah in oral form. Even though today that part that was once oral is already written down, 
most of it. But at one time it was oral. In other words, there's an oral tradition that was handed down, Balpeh. So even though Olam Abba was not written down, the world to come was not written down in this written Torah, but we do have a tradition that was handed down from Moshe Rabbeinu that this will happen, this does exist. There is another world. Not everything was therefore written down. Anybody who, however, wants to experience Olam Abba, in this world it's possible. Rabbis tell us if you practice Shabbat properly, Shabbat is 160th of Olam Abba, of the world to come. If you want to have a little bit of a feel and experience what Olam Abba is like, what it will be like, then if you observe Shabbat properly, properly, in other words, you abstain from all the melachot and you sanctify the day, you should be able to experience 160th of Olam Abba, a little bit of the feeling of what Olam Abba is like. Rabbis remind us that even though this Olam Azeh is very important because this is where we perform the mitzvot, this is the world of action, Olam Asiyah, don't forget, don't be distracted, this is just a prosdor, this is just a hallway. This Olam is a prosdor le Olam Abba. In the end, what we're doing here is we're actually preparing ourselves for Olam Abba. So even though the Torah doesn't say it, the rabbis need to remind us about this fact because many people are simply distracted, they forget themselves, they work so hard, they think that they have to make it, you know, they have to make a lot of money, they have to build themselves a home, they have to buy the latest car. This is an accomplishment to them. And the rabbis remind us, remember, yes, you are here for a number of years, but this is not it, this is not the Ikar. The most important destination is still waiting. That is Olam Abba. This is only a hallway. What do you do in a hallway? You dress up. You look yourself in the mirror. You, you're about to enter the palace of the king. So the destination is not here. We only come here for a number of years and then we leave. So this is the world of action, of performance. This is where we acquire our ticket for Olam Abba. You have to earn it, we said before, right? This is where it's, this is where it's done. But the tachlit, the ultimate yad, the ultimate destination is Olam Abba. Why does the Yetzer succeed in distracting so many people to thinking that this is it? Because the Yetzer pays cash and Hashem pays with a post-dated check. Right? That is the idea of mitzvot that we're performing here and seemingly there's no compensation right away. So Hashem says, I, I will compensate you, but it's a post-dated check. It's in Olam Abba, it's later on. Well, I want to enjoy life now. And the Yetzirah says, I'll let you do that. So the Yetzirah lets us enjoy life here, makes us forget about the ultimate destination. That is why people fall for it. They are misled, they are distracted in thinking that this is it. That's all there is. Afterwards, you fold up and you, you go back to wherever you came from. According to some, to dust. But according to us, of course, you don't just go to dust, the body goes to dust, but the neshama, which is the ikar, the essence of the human being, continues on its journey. First it makes a stop in Olam Neshamot, in Gan Eden, in Paradise, and then after Mashiach will come, it will continue on its journey. So that, of course, requires a little bit of uh, focus. People who are not focused, who do not learn Torah, they're never going to think about these ideas. And that's because the Yetzirah distracts him, and that's his job. Now that we understand the various reasons of why the Torah did not want to talk so much about Olam Abba, now we need to understand why we don't see any compensation for the mitzvot in this world. Well, first of all, we have to understand that the performance of the mitzvah itself is not just for a compensation. In other words, when we do something right, of course we'll be compensated. But there's more to that. Every mitzvah that is performed does something immediately for us. When Hashem tells us, for example, um, be uh, considerate when you find a lost object. Try to locate the owner. Don't overwork your donkey. Things like that. Or slaughter the animal in the most humane way possible through Shechita, 
not with an electric shock and not with a bullet. All these mitzvot, what do they do? They do something to our nature. So there is immediate compensation in a sense. It's not the reward for the performance of the mitzvah, but if you're actually benefiting from this mitzvah. It's actually doing something to you. All the mitzvot, that is pretty much what they have in common, other than doing His will, other than eventually getting our ticket for Olam Abba, it is actually doing something to our nature. We don't see it immediately, but that's what the Torah tells us. Our life depends on this. It's good for you. It's letovatcha, letivcha beacharitecha, that it should, you will benefit from this. We see all the indications that every mitzvah does something in the formation of one's personality. And that is what the meaning is of what we say in the, in the prayers. In the Mishnah, Ratsa Kadosh Bahu Lezakot et Israel, Lefikha Hirbala and Torah Mitzvot. Kadosh Bahu wanted the Jewish people to have many merits. That's why he gave them many mitzvot. That's the simple interpretation of those words. He gave us 613 because he wanted us to have a lot of credit, a lot of merit. The other interpretation of the word Lezakot is Lezakech. He wanted us to be refined. In order to refine our character, which is raw, after all, we have the evil inclination. In order to refine us, he gave us the mitzvot, and by way of the mitzvot, we're, we, we're supposed to be refining our character. So that is, the, is at least one consequence, or one byproduct, I should say, of the performance of the mitzvot, not just to be compensated for doing it, not only to get to where we need to get to, to accomplish a mission that we may not understand fully, but it's actually a benefit to us. When we perform the mitzvah, we actually get something out of it from ourselves. If couples were to follow strictly the Torah in every respect, there would always be shalom bayit. There would always be peace and harmony in the home. If they would understand exactly what the role of each one is, what their ultimate goal is, that there, if there's any disagreement, what they should do about disagreements, no need to fight consult with a rabbi or consult with the Torah. In this way, you, you will be able to solve a lot of problems. The Torah actually tells us all sorts of good advice, what to do in various situations, because if it was left to us, human beings, to figure out, we would have all sorts of opinions. Just look at the Knesset in Israel, 120 opinions on how to do something. Should we give in to the Arabs or not give in to the Arabs? How should we solve this problem? How should we solve that problem? Why are there so many opinions? Why do you have Democrats and Republicans in this country? Why can't everybody agree on the same thing? Because there's no Torah. There's not, they, they don't, they're not looking into what God's will is, what Hashem wants of them to do. They're basically relying on what their head, their, feel, their heart, their upbringing, their education is telling them to do. People have different tastes. People have different opinions. Some people are radicals, some people are leftists, some people are, are liberal, you know, libertinarians, as they're called, I think, right? People come from different schools. People come from different uh, backgrounds. Hashem does not want it, of course, for the Jewish people to be so divided. You know, if you're divided, you don't have any strength. You're always going to be fighting. Who's right? The Torah is right. So if everybody would be, would be following the Torah there would be very little to argue about. There are some things that people can disagree on, and that's another lecture. How could there be a Bet Hillel and Bet Shammai? How could they have two very opposing opinions? Supposedly, they're both trying to figure out what the Torah says. How come they can't arrive at the same opinion? Talk about that another time. Nevertheless, we need the Torah. We need to have the proper Hashkafa. Hashkafa means outlook. The proper outlook as to what is correct and what is wrong. I'll give you a quick example. It's, it's a little funny. You've heard it from me again, but I need to repeat it. You're about to marry off your daughter. Okay? You're Baruch Hashem. You're so excited. She's finally found her bashert, her, her soulmate. And now you've got to throw a big party. Does it really have to be a big party? Does, do you have to have... Uh, the most expensive flowers, do you have to have a, uh, a harp and a guitar and drums and all the instruments you can think of? How many people should you have playing music? Well, it depends. 
in which community you were raised. <sighs> Some of you already are, are laughing because you're guessing what I'm going to say next, right? Yes, that's true. If you were raised in the Persian community, you're right, you have a lot of problems. Why? Because there's all this pressure. They're expecting you, all these people, to be invited to your wedding and to be fed kebab. <laughs> Whoever said that you have to do that? Where does it say that in the Torah? The Torah says don't get into debt. Yeah, but there's all this pressure from society. Don't you want to do the right thing? So people are not looking to do necessarily the right thing. They want to please people. Now, so that's very nice to please people, but who said that you have to get into debt for that? You can't afford it, you can't do it. I'm telling you, write your invitations that there's no food and see how many will come. Yeah. The ones who come are your true friends. You can have a DJ too. You don't have to have a singer. That is already a $10,000 saving, I think, right? Avram, how much? How much you save, huh? The people do crazy things because they don't have the proper hashkafa. That's called hashkafa. Hashkafa means the proper outlook. If you have a rabbi, if you have somebody to consult with, you avoid all these problems. Anybody know about Boaz and Ruth? They had a wedding. You know how many people attended? Ten. That's it. In, in the backyard, not in the Hilton. They were really an older couple. Makes no he difference. Was, Makes no difference. If it was a Persian couple, even if he's 85, he would have thrown a big party. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure, sure. Anyway, I told you, recently somebody told me that he was at a bar mitzvah, a Persian bar mitzvah. They spent $100,000. And uh, the one who was making the bar mitzvah party had made a wedding a couple years before. So the friends came over to this man that just made a bar mitzvah party for $100,000. How come the wedding was so cheap and the bar mitzvah is so, uh, so uh, lavish? He says, you can't get a divorce from a bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, they're becoming smart. Unfortunately, in some communities, there are too many divorces. So why invest so much in a wedding? Again, we're back to the point of hashkafa. The Torah teaches us how to behave, how to do things right. This is an enemy. Defend yourself. He's an enemy. He doesn't like you. If he has an opportunity, he's going to kill you first. Then kill him first. And why get yourself into trouble? Why trust him? The Torah tells us who our enemies are, and not too many people like us. And uh, obviously, some people still make the same mistake that Chamberlain made. I was right. He, Hitler lied. He still thinks he was right. If the Torah was all about accumulating mitzvot, accumulating uh, reward, accumulating merits, if that's what it was all about, you know what somebody would say after the age of 60, 65? I've had enough. I can retire now. In other words, if the Torah would get into a little bit the specifics of how much you get for this, how much you get for that, then that's what somebody may do. At some point, he might say, you know what, I've done enough. Why should I go to pray Shachri tomorrow? Why should I put on Tefillin? You know, I've had enough. Somebody once came to a rabbi. He was 80 years old. He says, Rabbi, I've had enough. Can you pray that I leave this world? 80 years is enough. So the rabbi, of course yelled at him, says, Tipesh, you're a fool. Even to live another day, just one more day, just to be fulfilling the mitzvah of tefillin, do you know how much compensation you receive? Just for one day, do you know what it means, an extra day? And what are people doing these days? Disconnecting a relative who is in a vegetative state, perhaps not even breathing on his own, just so he can leave this world. They don't understand that every moment in this world serves a purpose. Even in that state, it's Yisurim, it's called pain and suffering. But pain and suffering ultimately does something to the soul. There was a father who came in a dream to his son, why did you disconnect me? Had I been here a few more days or weeks, it would, I would have benefited so much in the, in, the, in the upper world. Now they're judging me. And they're weighing all the pain, 
versus all the sins, you know, because the, the, all the pain that one has atones, serves as an atonement. But you disconnected me from the machines. You let me go too, too soon. Now I have to pay for it. So, ultimately, Hashem does not want us to just focus on the reward, on the mitzvot. Otherwise, perhaps we would stop earlier than we're supposed to. And besides that, if everything was just about compensation, if that's what the Torah was all about, what would a Jew do if he was faced with a threat? Either you bow down to the cross or we shoot you. He may say, okay, the Torah is really nice. I really love it, but this is a tough situation. I'm just going to give in. Because if, if everything is only about reward and about compensation, he says, I, I have enough. I don't need this. This is too difficult. A Jew, in order for himself to be able to give his life if asked for, and that's another lecture, why are certain cardinal sins we have to give our life for? Where, where is he going to take the strength and the courage to give his life, to sacrifice his life, if everything is about reward? If everything is just about reward, he may not be able to, to have the courage and the strength to be able to, to not give in. He may say, you know what, forget it. I don't need to do it. This is too difficult. There are some Jews that do only that which is easy for them. As soon as it becomes a little difficult, they say, no, it's not for them anymore. In the end, the goal is that one should be doing something out of love. As the Pasuk says in Tehillim, Ki alecha horagnu kol hayom. The, the Jewish people allow themselves to be butchered for the sake of Hashem. They never gave in so easily. And where did they get the strength and the courage to do that? I was, obviously, they inherited from their parents. They saw their parents, how much it meant to them. They saw their grandparents, how much it meant to them, that they were not willing to give it up. Do you know that there were mothers who sold the jewelry that they had just in order to pay for their child's Jewish education? Everything. They sold everything. They gave up everything. Because this meant more than anything else, that the Jew that their children should remain Jewish, that they survive, that they should survive. What, what's more important than that? The money? You know something about money? There's a saying in Yiddish, on tachrichim, on shrouds, they don't sew pockets. You hear me, Nasha? On the, the shrouds that you have, they don't sew pockets, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a bank in the same Yeah, I see. <laughs> and tachrichim, they don't sew pockets because you don't take it with you. You don't take it well. Why should you have pockets on the shrouds for it? <laughs> anyway, if a Jew were to do everything for a reward, he would never have that courage to give his life for something that he believes in. Now we're into the second question. Okay. We talked about why the Torah does not mention Olam Abba, why we need to have complete free will. In order for us to have complete free will, things cannot be too obvious. Also, Hashem wants us to do things for the real purpose. Nevertheless, we do know for a fact that there is Sachar Ve'onish. There is reward and punishment. For, and one is accountable for all, all his actions. So the question is, why isn't there a reward, some sort of reward, for a mitzvah in this world? Why do we have to wait to enjoy the reward in another world? Why not here? Why not have some of it here? So I'm going to repeat again. Sachar onesh, reward and punishment, is one of the ikare haimunah. We believe one of the 13 principles that the Rambam clearly spells out that apply to our faith is that we believe that Hashem rewards good e deeds and that Hashem will punish those who rebel against Him. So it, it is part of our faith. But nevertheless, the rabbis tell us, Sachar mitzvah behai alma leka, that the reward that, that we are talking about, that is part of our tradition, is not to be found in this world. Why not? So the simple idea behind this is what we said before. It will interfere with our free will. That's a simple interpretation. Why don't we have a reward here? Because if the moment you perform a mitzvah you get rewarded, 
or the other way around, if you do an Avera, you immediately get punished, what does a child do when he puts his finger in the outlet and he feels the shock? He won't do it again so soon, right? He learned his lesson. If everything would be so obvious, reward and punishment immediately in this world after something is done or not done, then our free will would be interfered with. So the simple idea of why we don't see it here is so we should not know what to expect. Things should be a little bit clouded. Things should not be too obvious. Another reason is, HaKadosh Baruch cannot repay us for the performance of one mitzvah in this world. Because the reward for mitzvah is not in dollars, in euros, or in pesos. The reward for a mitzvah is something spiritual. This world is not spiritual. This world is a physical world. How is he going to repay us for the mitzvah with something physical? All the, all the riches in the world would not suffice, would not be enough for putting on tefillin one day. One day of putting on tefillin, it's not enough to give us all the riches in the world. So therefore, the compensation cannot be in this world. It's not in the same currency. Now let's look at an, the opposite example. Let's say somebody killed a hundred people. You hear? A hundred people. He murdered a hundred people. How many times can you put him to death? How are you ever going to punish him for killing a hundred people? For one person, maybe you can put him to death. But what if he kills a hundred people? How many times can you kill him? Can you ever give to him what he did? Never. So it's not possible. It's not possible at all to give one either the reward for a mitzvah or the punishment that is coming to him for doing a, such a terrible crime. Another idea is that the essence of the human being is not the physical body. The essence is the neshama. The neshama is spiritual. The neshama is the one that's going to get rewarded, not so much the body. So therefore the neshama gets its reward in a place that it calls home. And that is olam haba, or olam neshamot, the world of the souls. Not here. This is not the world of the neshama. The neshama just acts like a captain of the ship. It gives the orders. But it is influenced by the body, of course, by the yetzara. So this is not a place for the neshama to get its reward. But, as I mentioned in the past, there will be a period of time called Yemot HaMashiach, the days of Mashiach. If Mashiach comes today, we have 232 years left to the year 6000. Those will be Yemot HaMashiach. Our tradition says that the bodies who will rise or who will be around, will also benefit. In other words, that will be a time where both the neshama and the body will receive some benefit. After all, that same body did work hard. It did get up early in the morning, even though it was tired to go to shul, to go to a shiur, to go to pray, to go to learn, to do mitzvot. So the body too reserve, deserves some reward. That reward that the body will receive will be in the period of time called the Mota Mashiach. Otherwise, the main reward is going to the neshama, the neshama, therefore, cannot enjoy its reward here. So the reward has to be reserved for the spiritual world, either in Olam neshamot upstairs, or in Olam Abba. All right, now that we understand that there's no real compensation for one's mitzvot in this world, we need to spend a few minutes on a very important parasha, two parashiot, actually. Parashat Bechukotai and Parashat Kitavo. Parashat Bechukotai it's very interesting. It tells us, listen, if you follow my statutes and you fulfill my commandments, you will have rain on time, you will have a prosperous economy, you will have no war, you will have it easy. If you don't, things are going to get very, very tough. What's that supposed to be? Is that reward and punishment? No. It has nothing to do with reward and punishment. We said clearly before, that there is no reward for the mitzvah in this world. So what's that? The commentaries explain all that's intended to be is if we follow the rules, life will be easy. If we don't follow the rules, then life won't be easy. It has nothing to do with the compensation. Hashem says, I want you to have an easy life. I don't want you to work too hard. If you behave yourself, you do everything right, I will help you. You will have no interference from your enemies. Everything, you're playing by the rules, so nature will play by its rules. You break the rules, so nature will break its rules. It's all midah, kenegi midah, an eye for an eye. It's up to you. And besides that, 
I need to somehow signal to you that you're, you're not doing so something right. How am I going to signal to you? There's no fax. There's no email. How is he going to let us know that we're not okay? He's going to let us know through our enemy. He's going to let us know through the economy, and he's going to let us know through the weather. These three will signal to us that something is wrong with us. So everybody is upset at the Arabs, at Hamas, at Jihad, at Fatah. They should, really be ex uh, they should really be upset at themselves because if these are causing us so much trouble, it must be that we're doing something wrong, but they don't get it. They, they somehow don't get it. You know, the Jewish people have a big problem. Usually when somebody gets hit over their head, they usually turn back to see who it is. They're not even turning back. That's why they're called stiff-necked. What, what does stiff neck mean? They don't turn. They don't move. They just continue on in a stubborn fashion, thinking that everything will be okay, or looking for solutions in a totally different place where the real solution lies with themselves. They are the source of the problem. So Parshat Chukotai and Parshat Kitavo and various other Parshiyot in Torah that have portions of the Tochacha, of the rebuke, that Hashem tells us things may happen, and unfortunately all of that happened during the first destruction of the Temple, the second destruction, the various pogroms and persecutions and crusades, and lately the Holocaust and what's happening in Israel, all of that terrible suffering, all that pain, all those millions of Jewish souls that lost their life, what for? What's the source of anti-Semitism? Which is another lecture in itself. It's all meant to signal to us that we should change our ways. So Hashem has to have a way to signal to us has nothing to do with reward and punishment per se for what we did at any given time. There are, however, certain mitzvot and certain averot that there, are, there is compensation in this world. Rabbis tell us that for certain acts, for certain deeds, one will be punished in this world. There's a list of a few terrible crimes that if one commits them in this world, he will not leave this world without getting some sort of package, some sort of uh, punishment for what he did. There are, so, there are certain crimes that if they are committed, besides the Gehenom, besides what is awaiting him in the upper worlds, it, something definitely happens in this world. And there's a whole list. We don't have the time to go into all of them. But there are a few people that get hit over their head in this world too for all sorts of reasons. In the same way that people get hurt for things that they've done here in this world, they also will be compensated for certain things that they've done here. We say it every day in the morning. We read in the, in the prayer book, it's really a Mishnah, there are certain things, there are certain mitzvot, there are certain mitzvot that if you perform them, you will eat the fruit in this world, but the principle is still reserved for you in the world to come. What is that supposed to mean? What is the fruit? You eat the fruit in this world, but the care and the principle is still reserved for Olam Abba. Perot, the fruit, is like the interest. Imagine you're giving somebody a loan, right? So you collect interest, but the principle is still yours. When the term is up, the loan is up, you're going to collect the whole principle. There are certain mitzvot, that if we perform them in this world, we will benefit from the interest. It's not the real reward. It's still not the real reward. The real reward, the, the keren, is waiting for us in Olam What are some examples? Kibud avayim, honoring one's parents. Gimelut chasadim, acts of kindness, whether it's bikur cholim, visiting the sick, whether it's halvayat amet, attending a funeral, whether it's lasot shalom ben adam lechavero ben ish ishto, making peace between a husband and wife and between two friends. There are various mitzvot that are all really part of something called gemilut chasadim. The bigger category is, is gemilut chasadim. Going to pray regularly, iyun tefillah, have, uh, praying with kavana. Talmud Torah keneged kulam, obviously the learning of the Torah is a very important mitzvah. These, one will actually have some benefit from, from them in this world. What's an example of a benefit for this mitzvah? Anybody know? What kind of a benefit can one have from performing these mitzvot? Well, let's take a look at two examples that the Torah, the, the Torah itself tells us clearly what the benefit is. Kibud avayim and shiluach haken. 
Shiluach HaKen is sending off the mother bird, and then taking the chicks, the, the small birds for yourself. What will happen? You will have Arichut Yamim. Your life will be lengthened. Life will be lengthened could also mean that it will not be shortened. You know, if something, were, if it was supposed to be short, if it, or something was going to make it short, this will act as a protector. In the same way that Tzedakah. What does it say about, about Tzedakah? Utzedakah tatzil mimavet. Acts of charity will protect one from death. The rabbis tell us from death. Everybody dies in the end from an unnatural death. In other words, tzedakah, if it's done on a regular basis, of course, has that property of protecting one from danger. So certain mitzvot have a segula. Segula means that they have something special, unique about them that can actually help us in this world too. Rabbis also tell us that in the event an individual has more sins than merits, he's a big rasha. He has a few merits. They may actually compensate him for those few merits in this world. Because he has so much bad that eventually you know where he's going. So therefore, the little bit of good that he did, they give him here. That is why you may see a, a wicked man who's doing very, very well, and you may wonder, why is he doing so well? Hashem may be paying him off for all the good deeds that he's done here. The other way around, if you see a tzaddik, a righteous man, who's having a difficult life, first of all, it could be because that's his mazal. And when we spoke about mazal, fate, destiny, the mazal of one has to do sometimes with a previous reincarnation. That's his tikkun. That is his mission. That is what he has to go through. In fact, regardless of what kind of a man he is now, he's chosen to be a tzaddik somewhere at his middle age years, 30, 40, 50, and he was already born with a certain mazal. That could be why he's having a, the struggle. But it could also be that this tzaddik is such a great man, is such a tzaddik, such a go so good, but he has done a few sins, a few terrible sins. So Hashem says, you know what? I'm going to take care of those sins here. It is better to be embarrassed here than to be embarrassed in the world to come. It is better to pay for our debts here than to have to pay for it later. So sometimes, Hashem says, let me take care of it here. That is why many, many people, many, perhaps the majority, when we reach our older, our age, you know, 90, 95, is that Hashem 100 or more? You know, we start getting Alzheimer's, perhaps, arthritis, uh, and this hurts and that hurts. And what is that for? And there's many, many things that people go through. I don't want to give you the examples because some of them are really not too nice, not too uh, comfortable. But the fact is that they all have, what they all have in common is that they atone. Every Yesurin, everything, everything that, that a person ha suffers from eventually atones. And if all that atonement is being reserved for his later years, that is a big favor that Hashem has done us, that in our younger years, when we're earning a living, we should be healthy. Imagine if somebody, God forbid, is crippled at the age of 25. What now? Right? So if somebody has already married off all his children, and now he's 83, 84, and now he's just, you know, slowing down, that's not the end of the world. That is a, is a kapara in a sense. Nevertheless, we ask Hashem, Al tashlichenu le'ed zikna, kichlot kochenu al tazvenu. We still pray to Hashem, please, don't abandon us in our, in our older years. We still want to be healthy to enjoy our kids and our grandchildren until the very last day, if possible. But that's a blessing. If somebody at the age of 95, 96, 97 has his head with him, he's completely sane, physically able to jog. I don't know too many like that, right? But at that age, there are some people who are really active. Very few. It's a beracha. It's really a beracha. It's a blessing. Besides a good mazal, it's also a blessing. It has nothing to do with the genes. Don't think just about genes. Hashem, of course, rewards people, and some of that reward is also in this world for some mitzvah that they may have done for somebody else. I want to share with you an incredible story before we finish of how things can happen in this world through tremendous hashgacha pratit, 
tremendous divine providence in ways we never imagined. I don't know how many years ago, but there was an Israeli soldier walking on his own late at night in uh, one of the Palestinian camps in Israel. And a sniper shot at him. And of course he fell. He was bleeding profusely. Nobody saw, nobody heard. But about 15, 20 minutes later, another Israeli soldier was walking by, saw his comrade on the floor, picked him up, put a band-aid on him, and was able to save his life. Baruch Hashem, very good that this ended very happily. This soldier, whose life was saved, never knew who his savior was. His mother was very, very curious. Very curious as, as to who that savior was. And she put up signs in her shop in Kiryat Gat, I think it was, where they were living. Whoever was in that brigade at that time, in that Palestinian camp in that year, who remembers this incident, can you please call us up? We would like to thank you. Yeah. So uh, nobody came. Nobody came, nobody showed up. It was a mystery, like nobody knew. All right, it happens. One day, this lady at the grocery, this is already a couple years later, this lady at the grocery receives a visitor from a faraway city in the north. I think it was Haifa. A lady comes in and she says, you know what? I want to talk to you. I want to have a private talk with you. What is it about? You did me a big favor years ago. And I want to thank you for that big favor. Oh, really? I did you a favor many years ago? Yeah. See, many years ago, I was having trouble. I had become pregnant, and we were very, very poor, struggling. And the doctor was telling me that I should abort the fetus. And uh, I was so confused, did not know what to do. And I stopped by here, and I remember that you pulled me out, sat me down, and took the time to give me encouragement and strength that everything will be okay, the baby will be fine. And you told me even to change doctors. And I did as you told me. And Baruch Hashem, I had a baby boy. And uh, he's grown up. And I want to thank you for that. And she says, you know what? That's interesting. Is it possible that it, it was your son that perhaps was at the same time with my son at that camp? Somehow the two women, as they were talking, started putting things together, and it turned out that the lady whose son was injured, she was the one that saved the other lady's son, the other, lady, the, other, the other lady's baby. And then it was the turn of that baby when he grew up to save that woman's son who was lying injured. Did you see what, what happened over here? How... The two crossed paths years ago, and then they crossed paths again. Ashgaha Pratit. What is this all about? Kadosh Bahu keeps tracks of all the good deeds. I just want to finish that it's important to remember that the rabbis tell us Lefum Tsara Agra, the one is rewarded according to the effort he puts into a mitzvah. Many people can be doing the same mitzvah, but the more effort that goes into a mitzvah, the greater the reward will be. It's not going to be the same reward. And that is why Baalet Shuva are on a such higher level than those who were spoon-fed Judaism from birth. If somebody had to struggle to fight his parents, to fight the surroundings, to be Jewish, his compensation would be much greater than many, many of the righteous of this generation who grew up with it. It was natural to them. They didn't have to fight so hard for it. The reward for the performance of any mitzvah will always be judged according to how difficult or how easy it was. What were the circumstances? In what generation did this man or woman live? That is how they will be rewarded. In the very end, however, even though today many Jews struggle and many Jews feel that perhaps they have to do something because their parents tell them to do it, 
it doesn't come naturally to them, they don't do it out of love, even though that's the situation for many, many Jews, they don't do it out of love. They do it either out of fear or out of some interest that they have. HaKadosh Baruch says when Moshiach will come, one of the biggest changes that will occur with the Jewish nation is what Hoshea HaNavi says. Hoshea HaNavi says something beautiful. When I reappear to you once again, you will no longer be called, you will no longer call me my husband. You will call me my man. Ishi velo ba'ali. Ishi means my man. It's much more personal. It's much more loving. It's much closer than calling him my husband. Because in Hebrew, ba'ali means he who owns me. It's a much more heavier term to describe a relationship between a husband and wife. Ba'ali. Uikrali ishi. He's going to call me my man. In other words, Bezat Hashem, very, very soon, we should have that zechut, that Am Yisrael will have a much more stronger relationship with the Kadosh Baruch Hu, where we will be able to call him our man, and of course at that time he will call us our, his children. Bezat Hashem, Amen.